Good morning, everybody. We are still um, admitting some people into the room. But I'm gonna um, I'm gonna introduce our speaker and tell you what session you joined. Uh, welcome to Foods as Medicine and Postpartum Support. Um, before we begin, I want to remind you that we are recording our sessions. We'll be offering time for questions after the presentation, but you're welcome to continue using the chat during the session. And uh, just please keep your mics muted and then use the hand raise reaction during the Q&A uh, to request to speak. Uh, to access the slides and handouts, you in the Whova app, you tap the documents tab and select session documents. And then you should be able to find the session and tap the link to follow along. And the notes page for the session can be found on page 11 of your program. So I'll give everybody a second to, to find that and get themselves oriented. We're still entering people. Welcome, good morning to everybody who's just joining. You are in foods as medicine and postpartum support. All right, it is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Maria del Carmen Paracano, the owner and mommypreneur of Sana Sana, Indigena and Ironwood, Ironwood Metalworks, a Chicana Indigena born in Phoenix. She's also a mother, wife, community organizer, comadre, danzante y mujer de ceremonia, as part of the Calpoali, Nahuacalco, and other ceremonial circles. Carmen received her undergrad degree from ASU, graduate degree from GCU, and her culinary degree from Scottsdale Culinary Institute, Le Cordon Bleu. Carmen is the executive director of the Siwapakli Collective, co-founder Mecha de ASU's Chicana Chicano graduation, and board member of the Sagrado, the Orchard Community Learning Center in South Phoenix, and the National Parents Union. Carmen also supports birthing families as a comadrita, providing postpartum and rebozo support. Carmen, the floor is yours. Good morning. Um, pleasure to be here this morning with everybody. Uh, just wanting to start off first, um, thank you, Kendra, for that introduction, and thank you for the organizers of the fourth trimester conference today. Um, just really wanting to offer for my home fireplace um, just a little bit of blessings here this morning, some smoke for everybody offering this on this day, um, wanting to acknowledge these lands. I'm thankful for uh, the prayer this morning that really touched on things um, as far as the territories in the land. And as indigenous peoples, we, we come from all over. You know, we, we travel, we travel um, migration is a human right. And so I want to acknowledge um, not only the Pipash and Akmeo Atam territories here, but I also like to acknowledge my lineage um, coming from Texcoco, Mexico, which is uh, right outside of Teotihuacan, along with um, my father's family, Northern uh, Raramuri people, or that are also known as Taraumara. So really want to acknowledge them as their daughter. Uh, my mother's name was Maria Cristina Parra Martinez. My father's name is Jose Arturo Parra Arana. Um, and really wanting to acknowledge them during this time. Um, <clears throat> also, like to speak in my own language uh, for a minute. Um, Imashpancinco, Nawayolke, Notoka, Maria del Carmen Parracano, Tasokamatiwe, Tonan Sintlali, Tasokamatiwe, Tasoteo, Tasokamatiwe, 
Pacli, Tazocamactiwe, Carpoli Nahuacalco, Tazocamactiwe, Seopacti Collective, Tazocamactiwe, Ancestors. Really just wanting to acknowledge again, my ancestry, my lineage, these teachings, my community, the various ceremonial communities that I've interacted with the past for over the past 20 years. And just really thankful for, for being here today, being able to share a little bit about my story along with what has happened in my life to get to this point, to be able to share with everybody regarding um, food as medicine and postpartum care. So we'll go ahead and share my screen for everybody. Okay, sorry. Perfect. So just a little bit of the Siwapakli Collective, just really focusing on community, spirituality, knowledge, and culture. I just shared a little bit about my lineage, my family, my mother, um, who on, along this road, this path to learning about ancestral foods and food as medicine, she was my first teacher, you know, just like everybody else, our mother, um, that womb, that um, jicara, the way in Spanish that that space in our bodies um, as being that first home place. And so I really want to acknowledge her and her teachings as a, she was actually a womb worker. Um, we grew up with people in our home constantly all the time coming in and out. And so I was surrounded with that, surrounded with um, her working not, not only on mothers, but on children. And then also having my father being a, a, uh, a wasero or somebody who works with bones and aligning the body and things like that. So. It was very much part of our upbringing here in Phoenix. Um, my family first migrated here in the 80s. I was the first of my family to be born um, in Arizona, what's, what's known as Arizona. Um, and so during that time, like I said, we learned, we were in the kitchen with my mom very young. There, I'm one of nine children. And so Every meal was an assembly, you know, like trying to, uh, somebody was in charge of doing one thing, another person, you know, I, my, my, the really big memory I have is when we would make chiles rellenos, uh, which is like stuffed um, poblano peppers. And so my job was to whisk, whisk the egg whites, you know, for, for that. And so I remember the assembly of that, which is now known as like a, like a, breading process or, you know, and so at the time I didn't know that. <laughs> so I just whisked the, the egg, you know, as much as I can and stood there forever and, and learning how to cook traditional dishes from my, from my lineage to share with folks and in our family. Um, so really this path of mine began in 20, I'm sorry, in 2003 where my parents actually became diagnosed with gestational, I'm sorry, with type two diabetes. Um, at that time, I was working nonprofit. Um, my undergrad's in nonprofit administration. So I was already working in the nonprofit world as a director of education and, and wellness programs. And so at that time, um, I decided to go to culinary school because I thought maybe at that point I would be able to learn how to cook for my family better. What, can, what do I need to learn to help them, you know? And so um, I went to Scottsdale Culinary Institute and that program took me about three years because I went part-time as since I was working full-time. And I also consider this my, my past life almost because that was before children <laughs> because a lot of things have changed since then. Um, but so thankful that I had that opportunity to be able to do different things, learn, engage, be part of community as, you know, prior to that. Um, so with cul in culinary school, I learned that the foods being used, French cuisine, um, classical French cuisine was what we were being taught. That was a curriculum. At that time, I also learned this isn't my food. This is not my people's food. This is, you know, in culinary school, I gained about 60 pounds 
just because of the ingredients that were being used, such as lactose, um, gluten, um, so many heavy frying, so many things that um, I was not used to. You know, my body genetically was not able to process a lot of this these foods. So, um, and learning that also, um, I'm I'm huge on like food history and and history in general, and so. Um, I also learned the various contributions of the continent, not only from my tradition, but from others in the South, um, South America, North America, just really highlighting the foods of this continent and learning how they came to be as we, like I mentioned before, migration, you know, migration as a human right for not only the uh, humans, but animals and, and then learning the history of the trade routes, you know, that the tradition, the what are considered traditional trade outs for the corn, also learning about the history of potatoes and things like that. So th these are what I consider um, ancestral foods and we'll get into that further. Come to uh, fast forward to 20, 2012, where I became pregnant with my first child um, and ended up at a very early on, I was, must have been only about 16 weeks probably maybe sooner than that, or I had gained 30 pounds during my first um, trimester. And so knowing my family history, I asked my, my providers to test me, you know, do a glucose test. And I had to advocate for myself to say, me gain, myself gaining this weight is not normal. I need you to test me. And they're like, well, we don't do it until, you know, um, I believe it's, be, you know, the third trimester. And I said, no, I need you to do it now because I know that this is not normal for my body. And I, I just, and it runs in my family. So I need you to test me. And they did. I ended up having gestational diabetes and having to manage that um, through my food. And so being able to, well, I was already ve mainly vegetarian at the time but also had to focus on and, and relearning, remembering things that my mother had shown me. So through these different pregnancies, which I'll go into more further um, this morning, is what helped establish Sana Sana Foods. And so Sana Sana Foods was very much at the, my last birth was three years ago. And, and this made us want to help other people these teachings that we, we gained from not only reconnecting through our lineage and our food, through food was also the acknowledgement of the continent, the mother earth, the, as indigenous people, we always think of the elements as us belonging to the earth. And so using what the earth has provided for us and helping use these foods, herbs, plant relatives to really heal our community and heal, my, and heal our bodies. So I did want to touch a bit because it's all interwoven, just like this Reboso here, all the different experiences we have, um, not only for my family and that of the Siwapati Collective, but everything being interwoven into how we see things as that like web of life, right? And so the birth story of the collective coincidentally has to do with one of my births. And so I just wanted to share that briefly. Um, a lot of us, <clears throat> <clears throat> have known each other. A lot of the members of the collective have known each other over the past 20 years, 20 plus years even, um, in different ceremonial circles um, and different different relations with relatives here on this in the state and out of state within this continent. Many have um, are danzantes or what we consider, you know, dancers of that of the of traditional lineage of of dan of um, historic, or I should say traditional dancing from Mexico, one of the different ways, um, along with colleagues from college or high school or neighbors or just past community organizers that reunited when it came, when they, when they felt that need to reconnect, right? So now our own evolution, we are now a nonprofit. Um, now six years in as the Seba Bakli Collective. And like I mentioned, traveling, reconnecting, really focusing on sharing traditional knowledge and wisdom and promoting overall health and wellness. And this is what 
you know, we started with a founders group of 13 and that has now, you know, grown, but still very much reconnecting, being relationship-based organization and trying to see how we could heal our communities and really, really, truly caring as the theme of this conference, you know, really, truly being a village for those in need. So now healing through your food. Um, I am an plant-based ancestral foods chef. And so this is all mainly just based on my own experience, the, te the, the teachings of my, my personal lineage, but I encourage others to reconnect with, you know, talk to family, ask questions, and see how you could learn more. You know, at the time, like I mentioned, I was diagnosed with gestational diabetes. At the time, I ended up also having postpartum preeclampsia with my, with my last two births. And at the time of my last birth, I also had type uh, stage four liver disease, which um, we were able to heal through or reverse, you know, however, I consider myself a recovering diabetic, but all done through plant-based food and very specifically during the postpartum, uh, during the pregnancy and postpartum time. So ancestral foods, what are they? There, I see a big difference when we call things traditional and ancestral. And so for, for some folks, this is just a technicality of language and vocabulary. But we also see that traditional foods, I like to give the example um, of fry bread. You know, that's what most a lot of people think of as traditional foods and that's not a traditional food. And so not to knock it at all because at the time that's what people had to survive off of. And so just thinking of how Ancestral foods are foods that people lived off of and ate prior to European contact. So pre-colonial foods, if you will, and how those naturally genetically for most folks, our bodies know how to process these foods. And so when you introduce other types of foods, this is what affects the body, whether it be um, through diabetes, whether it be, you know, and, and the body doing so much during pregnancy and postpartum, this is the ideal time to try to extract things that your body doesn't need. Because again, this leads to these diseases, you know, these diseases that our body doesn't know how to deal with because it is foreign to them. So just some few recommendations here as we begin, you know, shopping local, if you feel inclined to start in your own garden, get cooking yourself, try to experience new things, um, as well as engaging our elders and family, engage your community, just talk about different things. You know, here pictured is our, what I make, an, what I call my ancient granola made with popped amaranth, popped quinoa and seeds. And if you look at the history of amaranth alone, I, I like sharing this because it puts things in perspective, I think, especially coming from a place of when it comes to food and the importance of our survival as people, you know, the amaranth grain was once outlawed for my, for my lineage and our stories that we share is it was once outlawed upon colonization, upon the, the first invasions of, in the South, this grain people who would work with it, touch it, engage it, eat it, would be killed because of, the, of its sacredness, but also because of it's such a high nutrient food in itself, that a way to control people, and I think we've seen this in different ways, um, especially now, systemically, the way to control a people is controlling their food source. And so um, unfortunately, many of us have experienced this, you know, especially during this pandemic. And so I just want to put that out there is that, you know, we need to break, try to break away from those systems, really try to provide for our own, our own food sovereignty. You know, when it comes to indigenous food sovereignty, it's really that reconnecting to land, reconnecting to the old ways of, of growing, of harvesting, of processing, and learning, having relationships with our food. And how do we, what is our, what is our relationship to food? You know, and how, how you want your family to grow? How do you want your body to heal? And ultimately, how do you interact in community? So again, sharing from my perspective and my family, my lineage, these are some of the foods, um, the contributions from this continent that we, ha that we have shared. 
um, a lot of them are considered superfoods and because of they're considered now, now they're considered superfoods, but our ancestors knew these were the foods <laughs> to eat, right? So listed, you know, corn, different varieties of corn, you know, cuitlacoche was a corn fungus, um, is considered now a delicacy, you know, and before it was, I mean, anybody who grows corn will occasionally have cuitlacoche and can then harvest it and use it, but it is considered a type of fungi. You have different types of beans, you know, I, I like to speak of tepary beans specifically because um, it's a bean that's that's indigenous to this territory, our autumn relatives here, um, and it's not the only one, there's so many different varieties of beans that so many uh, across the, the continent are grown along with corn, but tepary beans specifically hold three times as much protein as a regular pinto or black bean. And so when you're dealing with trying to add more protein to diet, especially if you're a birth worker working with folks that need to, are either uh, iron deficient, need to add more, if they're plant-based mainly and add wanting to add more protein to their diets, these are the types of, of ingredients you would want to incorporate. Another uh, item to touch on is a lot of times uh, I would get asked a lot, um, where do you get your protein if you don't eat meat? You know, and so, all plants have protein. It's just really learning about which foods such as quinoa and amaranth that truly hold the highest nutritional um, or the highest amount of protein as a, in the plant source. Um, you know, avocados, chia, again, tons of protein. And then you have your more regional foods like choya buds, mesquite, um, wild rice in the east, potatoes in the south, you know, different types of ingredients that you could try to incorporate. And it's funny because a lot of times you think of vanilla and you're like, oh, I'm not baking anything or I'm not, you know, you think of that connection there. But vanilla and cacao, which is the chocolate, um, was used as currency. So how can we then think of it that way? It's so valuable at one point in, in society that it was used as a currency to trade and purchase things. And so how do we then use that in our daily lives? How do we connect with the foods? Um, and then you have ancestral game, wild game, which as indigenous peoples, we would hunt, you know, hunter gatherers. And so having that same mentality when it comes to healing our bodies, you know, but there's buffalo, venison, fish, turkey, it, different insects as well. Um, and I'm just speaking to those, like I said, just those of my region, but there's so many more throughout the continent, you know, different type, whatever was in the region uh, where people lived, that's what you try to work with and that's what how you would survive. <clears throat> Some of the herbs that I use, and again, if you're, you know, check with your birth worker, if you have one, check with your midwife, your doula, um, your comadrita, as to what would work for you. These are, are items that worked for me in helping not only level my, my blood sugars, but also help with hypertension. Like I mentioned, I had um, on my third pregnancy, actually not my third, it was my fourth one. Um, I was I had postpartum preeclampsia. And so bedridden, I had to go to emergency. They started me on a um, magnesium drip. Um, and so they also placed me on a medication that put me at risk of a heart attack, stroke, and seizure. And so fortunately, by that time, I had the support of the Ciudad Bacli Collective, where people came to support me with cooking food, um, mainly being plant-based at that time. So really encouraging folks like, oh, if, which is great, which I also encourage in some of my recommendations down the down uh, that we're going to see later. Um, is building that community, you know, really having that type of support system wherever you can, not being afraid to ask for the help when needed. Um, like I mentioned, I was bedridden. My husband needed support. My children needed support. And so there was different ways that um, that the collective helped at that time. But touching on the, the, the herbs here, dandelion leaf, which many are familiar with, 
um, cinnamon tea, which is my personal favorite that actually would have um, one of my one of my comadres and while I was in labor brought me a gallon <laughs> of to the hospital. So it's possible. Um, nettle teas, rose hip teas only used during postpartum time to help cleanse the body. Um, but there's so many different ben health benefits associated with it. The one I drank the most with um, trying to level my my to, to try to prevent hypertension. Uh, my third trimester was actually um, dandelion leaf that I would use often. Also connecting back to foods, you have baby's first foods. And so I wanted to touch on that briefly when it came to the chichiwalayo or what we um, consider lactation, you know, being able to um, not only does our body physically go through so many things during pregnancy, postpartum, um, but that healing process, again, with lactation is also another thing to keep in mind of the changes that happen with our body to prepare our bodies to be able to feed our child. And with baby wearing, of course, um, I'm a huge advocate <laughs> for it. And so I did want to include and in how that also helps with the milk supply, having your baby close to you, along with different teas, nutrient rich foods, I kind of I mentioned already. Um, and I will be sharing some recipes today, um, just easy things that could be done, including the items that um, I provided um, previously. And I'm sure there's so much information out there that could be accessed, but really just wanting to focus on, on these uh, ancestral foods. So the first recipe we have is actually a, a smooth, what I call my smoothie verde. And this, I know if you're not familiar with nopales, or cactus, and this is like the prickly pear cactus that could be consumed, cleaned. Um, you could purchase it now, pretty excess, um, <clears throat> um, excuse me. You could find it at like the Food City, Ranch Market, anything like that. If you have nopales in your yard, I would just be cautious of how you're, when you go to harvest them, how you clean them, and just being cautious of when you do that. Um, pineapple as a nat nat natural sweetener, um, even cilantro. cilantro. I know a lot of people have a different relationship with cilantro. Some love it, some don't. Um, or if you have papalo available in your garden, papalo is what um, the traditional herb we would use before cilantro came to this continent because cilantro is also um, Asian coriander or Chinese parsley. So it came to this continent later on. Chia seeds, you know, water, or you could actually substitute with a plant-based uh, milk. Spinach or kale, uh, agave if your pineapple isn't sweet enough. But again, if you're watching your sugar intake um, to prevent gestational diabetes, um, I would just be cautious with that. Ice, and then again, you could add any type of plant-based pro protein, any superfood mix you might make. Um, I know I, make my own um, using the maca, uh, cacao, different ingredients there. Um, and then spirulina is also one of the items that is actually grew for the lake that my mother's from, Lake Descoco. Um, <clears throat> so that's something that we would use, which is an algae. So we would use that often as well. Um, but you could also always add a sunflower powder, protein powder, or anything like that. Another smoothie here, just touching a bit on the berries. Um, mulberries grow abundantly here in Phoenix, in Arizona. So if you're able to have access to any mulberries, it's very specific time because they are very uh, temperamental. When it gets too hot, they don't last very long. <clears throat> so if you have a mulberry bush, just be, you know, make sure you clean it, you pick it. If not, any frozen ones you could access, or if you grow your own, you know, being able to throw them into a smoothie. Um, chia is, for me, in my smoothies, one of the main sources of, of protein heavy on the chia. I would even add another tablespoon if you'd like, and then using any type of oat milk, um, vanilla, I'm sorry, almond milk, um, and minimal on the agave. This is one of my favorite dishes, and I love preparing this for people postpartum. Um, this is our my quinoa con leche, which is a version of rice pudding, but just using quinoa because quinoa, again, high amounts of protein, um, antioxidants, all of that. 
Um, and then using a plant-based milk adds a little bit more protein. So I use almond milk for this. Um, postpartum, I also like to use a lot of cinnamon only because the cinnamon levels, whether it be in a tea um, or like added onto a dish is really great at trying to stimulate the uterus. And so that's why we only use that during labor or postpartum. Um, and really just, it tastes good really refreshing also in the summertime, which we're, which it's here, you know, here in Phoenix. So um, just taking that time to do that. Um, it's worth it. You could just, you don't even have to boil it if you don't want to, you just get some cinnamon sticks, place some, some, you know, make your, like a sun tea almost and just place it out somewhere and, and enjoy that later. Um, but the quinoa con leche, one of the big recommendations that my mom always had when it came to building my milk supply postpartum was also um, oatmeal. So oatmeal, um, I have another recipe here. We will share these and these slides will be available and they're also available on my website at sanasanafoods.com um, along with other ancestral uh, food recipes. Another big one that I like to share is uh, atoli, our blue corn atoli. So atoli also being rich, the, the nutrients of the blue corn specifically. And it's done in so many different ways. Atoli, I've heard, people um, make it with cornstarch, which is one way. Um, but I feel the whole corn itself, the, the ground blue corn is the most nutrient dense as well as better tasting personally, uh, using similar ingredients. And here we have, I made a blue corn atole with popped amaranth on the top using um, almond milk and then our ancient granola. So it's the popped amaranth, popped quinoa and different seeds um, using pepitas or sunflower seeds, pumpkin seeds and chia. Another easy dish that could be made ahead of time and dropped off to somebody postpartum is a three sister quinoa salad. And that seems pretty simple. I know uh, now quinoa, we use quinoa all the time. Um, but I like to use this as an example when I gave a, uh, a workshop one time for it um, over at the Pascoyaki tribe in Guadalupe. Um, and we led a workshop, a cooking demo for 30 grandmas. And it was beautiful because it was the first time they had grandmas, all that many grandmas together. But none of them have ever made quinoa because quinoa is comes from South America. So we're it's just a different ingredient that they're accustomed to. And so one of the grandmas um, was really excited. It was a four workshop series that I did. Uh, uh, and um, one of the last classes, she came up and said, you're gonna be so excited. And I, you know, I was talking with her and she said, I tricked my family to eat quinoa, <laughs> you know? And so she had a very, you know, it was a good experience for her to not only use the quinoa, but actually she's like, they didn't even, they couldn't even tell, they didn't notice. And so it was in a dish that she calls, it's called, we call it albondigas or like a meatball soup. But um, a lot of people put processed or like bleached white rice into the albondigas. And so she was able to make it with quinoa. And so adding even more protein to a dish that already had meat, right? And so just making little tweaks for, in our diets, you know, including these little by little um, makes a big difference, I think, especially when it's hard for people to make diet changes because they want the flavor. We're very much connected with um, our comfort. You know, we're very comfort eating, you know? And so uh, really trying to have people still feel the same way when they're trying that food. And so that's why when I made the quinoa con leches, because a lot of people connect with that warming sensation, that comfort food of rice pudding, you know, or something sweet. Um, and the three sister, the, the quinoa salad, you know, using beans, squash, corn, and adding that into the quinoa salad. So it's just protein among protein. Like I mentioned earlier, you know, that conversation of people as mothers, as women, or, or identify self-identified women, um, or people we work with, you know, it's 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 hard for people to ask for help. Being vocal and saying that you're you're in a vulnerable place where you need that support is important, you know, and ask asking people to do shopping for you, the cooking for you, even meal prepping, uh, cleaning, parenting. You know, I was look for very fortunate to have had, you know, partner support. I had a, uh, one of our comadres was 
support for my husband specifically, you know, during that time. And so, cause he had the other children at home as well. So um, really wanting to support them, taking mental health breaks, checking in with folks, whether even if it's through text or a phone call, I know our lives are, are so, so busy and taking, you know, asking people, rub my feet, rub my back, you know, do what you can um, as much as possible to help your body during that very special time, that sacred time, you know, birthing is ceremony. And so everything you put into your body during that time is, is ceremonial. That's the way I see it, you know, very taking that time to be able to not even, not only nurture your body, but nurture that little one growing in womb. And so I, we, I did want to share a little bit of some of the efforts of the collective when it comes to supporting folks. Um, the past of October of 20 of 2020, um, which I don't know if a lot of people are familiar with, but the Phoenix Indian Medical Phoenix Indian Medical Center uh, closed its labor and delivery, and so we wanted to be able to help support folks that were being displaced by the closure, and so we not only provided um, emergency relief for those families that needed help with support with you know if it was. Um, medical bills that they didn't weren't planning on because of IHS, you know, um, cost of hiring a birth worker because they were thinking they were going to be in the hospital setting and now that's changed, you know, or just supplies for travel, you know, people are coming from throughout the nation to 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 uh, seek services at the Phoenix Indian Medical Center, so. Um, just you know, any support they needed. And with that, we also included our um, indigenous food packs, care packs. And so with these, we use different items that we connected with um, indigenous growers, indigenous producers, um, locally, Ramona Farms, which you know has so many different ingredients that they use and harvest here locally, um, and making giving them away for free to families in need. And so um, I just wanted to share this brief, brief story, if we can, um, a few minutes of just listening of, to the importance. And I'm connecting this through as how food is so important to connecting, not only culturally, but especially during that pregnancy and postpartum time. Big meals with families, not supposed to be happening this year but the smell and taste of a particular food can still offer comfort, even when we're apart. Reporter Valeria Fernandez tells us how one group in Arizona is offering food as a source of healing, especially for indigenous and immigrant families here in the U.S. who have been hit hard by the pandemic. Did you put the chocolate already? No, not yet. That's when the food tastes good, yummy, yummy. It's Catalina's lunch break from online school. She's six and is watching her mother, Shara Nieto, prepare one of her favorite drinks on their patio. Put in some more milk. Nieto is making a toby. She's using pinole, ground corn, and almond milk and a bit of chocolate. It's a traditional Mexican drink that's very hot. Hi, Ninja. But the smell of atole reminds her of her mom. Her parents are from Yucatan and Chihuahua, Mexico. Something like pinole, for instance, is a part of who we are and has been a part of our, our ancestral heritage for a really long time. And that now I have an opportunity to share that with my daughter and hopefully someday she'll share that with her kids too. In March, Nieto was for low from her job as an arts educator. Money's been tight, so moments like this really nourish her. See, now you know how to make it too. <laughs> Nieto got the pinole and a big bag of other indigenous products for free at the Siwapatli Collective. The group, based in Phoenix, started five years ago to support women postpartum, but with the pandemic, it was clear they had to do more. Things like that, we have protein, uh, bites made out of blue corn. Some blue Chef corn. Maria Parracano is handing out bags of indigenous dry foods. There's tapery beans and wheat berries, organic blue corn, coffee. She explains this to a young couple just arriving to Paris's offices at the Suwapatli Collective, where she is a co-founder. Wow, thank you guys. No problem. And there's coffee. Over Food like this coffee. isn't found everywhere in Phoenix and can be expensive. Yeah, it helps out. The collective is giving the food away thanks to a grant from the city of Phoenix with federal funds. The goal is to reach indigenous, immigrant, and communities of color. 
those hit hardest by COVID-19. The nutritional content of our care packs mean the world of difference when it comes to healing our body, using this food as medicine, treating it as, as medicine and thinking, how can this help me? Food help para too. During her first pregnancy, she got diabetes and the fourth one, preeclampsia. She said eating food with indigenous ingredients, like the ones her mom used, helped her heal. The women, now part of the Suwapatli Collective, supported her too. One of them is Anjali Leffery, a psychologist. Now in a time of COVID where death and loss and grief are so in our faces, so important to us, right? So maybe food is the entry point and the gateway to like contact with the community, like how it always is, right? For culture and getting to know people, but then you get to know the real stuff, right? What's in the background and what's impacting them. And then here we are able to offer some other services or supports for them. Online yoga and workshops on women's health are just some of those services. They're also supporting the small businesses. Ramona Botten, who runs a family farm in Arizona, has contributed beans and wheat berries to the food packages. And by doing that, she said, she's passing on indigenous traditions. With this pandemic, we become spiritual again because of the losses that we can't be with our relatives, our loved ones and especially our elders now. They're going. Who is going to tell us these things? It was never written in the books. The collective has reached 1,500 families with food packages. On a recent Friday, a group of volunteers gave away the bags of food at an affordable housing community. Hi, girls. Hi. Thank you for bringing the flyer. Miguel Rodriguez, originally from Mexico, lives in the housing complex and works recycling metal. He's lost work this year. He struggled to support his family of seven. Pues igual una tristeza porque no no se puede uno reunir entre familia para que pueda uno convivir. It's sad, he said, that the pandemic will keep him from seeing family and sharing meals. Yet the food in the bags takes him back to his childhood, to his grandparents' farm and freshly harvested corn. For the world, I'm Valeria Fernandez in Phoenix, Arizona. Sorry about that. <laughs> so that just really, you know, when we're speaking specifically to about birthing, you know, and having that community support and building your village and being able to be there to help somebody, you know, that's one of the big things that, you know, I was very fortunate for. Um, I also had a hard time, you know, being able to ask people for that support. And so when we have people, we know of people where we're working with people that are expecting, you know, um, at times it does take a lot to be able to offer yourself to serve, you know, to serve them, to help them. Um, but a meal helps, you know, especially postpartum, being able to support somebody that way in a form of a meal train, in the form of just pre preparing. My mom, <laughs> my mom actually would drop off oatmeal, which I can make oatmeal, you know, <laughs> she would drop off oatmeal every morning uh, the first three weeks of my very first pregnancy, you know? And so, cause she, she's like, no, you have to have breakfast. You have to make sure you have your milk coming in. You wanna have that support. You know, she would make, um, you know, some of the, using some of the ancestral food ingredients is making the stews or what we, you know, we know we heard so much about like bone broth, right? And being able to have those nutrients to help heal our bodies. But it's the same thing with the food. You know, I think with the bone broth specifically, you're using um, animal-based proteins to be able to help heal that, but there are so many other plant-based proteins as well. Um, I just wanted to share briefly about our, our ancestral womb wellness gathering that's scheduled for June. Um, and we've been able to share more of this, more further this, you know, let's keep having the conversation around, root, around food as medicine and postpartum support. Um, also wanting to extend an invitation to some of the items included in our post in our indigenous food packs are available are available for purchase or for families in need. So if you have clients you're working with, if you have 
uh, folks, you know, a neighbor that you know is expecting might need some support, especially right now with the, with, with the pandemic, um, please reach out to us and we'll try to see if we can make that happen for you. Um, if you'd like to come into purchase, that's also available for you. Um, if you'd like to try to do that through our Indigenous Food Pantry. Thanks, Bill Herman. I just want to give you a 10 minute, sure. 10 minute warning. Yeah. No problem. That's is where I'm, I'm at the point to go ahead and uh, take any questions or I know there's tons in the chat, I think. <laughs> so I'll be happy to answer any questions um, that you may have. Hi, this is Elizabeth. I'm the moderator. So I've been looking at the chat. Thank you so much for being here and sharing your wisdom. Um, I'll just start with one of the first ones in the chat, which was where can we purchase the Pinoli Blue? That's from Marcella. Yes, so the Pinole Blue is a beautiful relationship we started with folks um, and they could, uh, yes, okay, I saw that one, okay. <laughs> so Pinole Blue is actually a relationship we have with folks out of Wichita, Kansas, and they actually source directly from the Tarahumara communities in Northern Mexico. So I am their only provider or source, um, or I should say we, <laughs> are their only provider or source here in Arizona. And so that is here available through our indigenous food pantry um, and uh, in our care packs. So we do have it on the Sana Sana Foods website for purchase, as well as here at the Arcewapakli Collective offices. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and please, anyone that has questions, drop them in the chat. I just wanted to kind of catch up Maria uh, from what was earlier in there and I'm sure she can take a look now um, too. I'm gonna grab one from the Q&A um, portion inside Whova and it's from Alisa and she says, food as medicine and postpartum support. So she's wondering if there are certain foods that can support with the postpartum or other way around. So I know you spoke about a couple of those but if you were gonna give a top three, top four, what would you ask or what would you suggest? Oh, um, let me see, let me think. If you're, if you're not completely plant-based, then obviously like a bone broth type of stew. Um, honestly, I think anything for somebody that is postpartum that doesn't have to cook, <laughs> will be thankful, you know, <laughs> we'll be thankful for what is prepared. But, you know, especially, um, you know, it really depends on the person and what they experience during birth and how they're healing. Like, say, for example, somebody has hem like hemorrhoids that are really, really excruciating. Like, you want to be conscious about the fiber and um, any gassy foods. So, like, eliminating beans or anything like that. So, really, it really depends on on how you're feeling physically, what you're what you're feeling in your body, and then. Uh, but if you're plant based, I would encourage as many, as many uh, high, higher protein, uh, nutrient rich ingredients. And Thank then during pregnancy, I did wanna share briefly, sorry. <laughs> during pregnancy, um, I was mainly vegetarian, but it just depends on, again, what your body's feeling they need. So um, during my very first pregnancy, I wasn't, prior to this, I wouldn't eat a lot of beans just because, especially refried beans. I was conscious of what I was eating if I were eating out or at home, obviously I would make my, my beans there, um, but out I would be conscious because of the lard being added and things like that, the possibility of in different ingredients being added to the food. So I always ask questions. Uh, so I learned from many, many, many restaurants <laughs> while well, I was expecting, um, even being a chef at the time though, I didn't want to cook, you know, I was just, especially when you're at, you know, 36, 38 weeks where you're like, I'm just done, <laughs> you know, physically and not wanting to cook for yourself, but ask a lot of questions, ask what's in, what, how do they make the item? Um, but mainly vegetarian base is what I was doing um, because um, animal protein, if you're not familiar with it, does inc increase um, swelling or inflammation in the body. So I was trying to prevent different uh, things happening to me. And so that's one of the one of the methods. So anything plant-based you could probably do very well. Um, I stay away from lactose also, um, especially right now. Um, it just doesn't work with me, you know? So any, any little cream, any cheese, things like that, it just doesn't work. And I know there's many folks who um, during pregnancy, you have, you're, you have different cravings, you know? So it really depends on what, you're, what you crave as well. 
uh, red raspberry leaf. I'm just seeing one from the chat really quick. Perfect, uh, yeah. Red raspberry leaf for pregnancy postpartum. Yes, res, um, specifically more postpartum, and it does help also as well as boosting your, your milk supply. Um, the only thing during pregnancy to be cautious of is because it may also stimulate the uterus. So you just want to be cautious and ask your provider, ask your, your, your birth worker. Um, another one that I personally loved postpartum was also high, or like Jamaica or hibiscus tea which is great, and, and ro um, rose hip. I would actually combine the two, but you do have to be cautious because rose hip also can stimulate the uterus. So both of those, only postpartum. Um, and, and yeah, so I think those are the ones I would emphasize on. Wonderful. I think there's a number of people that are begging to ask, do you have a cookbook? Oh. When you purchase your recipes, how can we get your wisdom on paper or in our computers? Yes, yeah, so the, I actually have a few recipes on my website, like I mentioned, at sanasanafoods.com, and I am actually working on a cookbook. And so um, along with my husband, we're actually working on our family plant-based um, ancestral foods cookbook that we do have a free coloring book on our website also that includes the history of, of a tlaxcali or a tortilla. Um, and so we did include, like my daughter says she's a professional corn grinder, you know, <laughs> and, so, and she's turning eight on Monday. So it's all just takes, you know, the time to teach them. And what I really like about that is that it shows how to not, you know, I say honor and I don't take it lightly. I honor tortillas and corn because of what it takes from one kernel to grow that corn for you to eat it. You know, just that a lot of people don't, they are disconnected and don't have that sense of, of knowing the value of growing your own food. And, you know, so that's also goes back to, you know, myself encouraging people of like, try growing something, even try with cilantro. That's probably one of the easiest things you could grow <laughs> and you use it and then go on to something else. You know, if it's a succulent, try it, try it out. Um, but I would encourage, you know, some types of food source to be able to do that because it's just so not only connecting with the earth itself, but like I said, knowing the value of growing your food makes a huge difference. And especially right now during the pandemic and what we saw early on, accessibility is huge. And so being able to do that for yourself and your family, like that's our goal for my family. We want to be sovereign food, like our own indigenous food, our own autonomy, and trying to do that through food. Um, Thank you so much, Carmen. Um, we're gonna we're gonna have to wrap it up so people can get to their next sessions. Uh, but people can continue the conversation. Please keep the conversation, the questions going in the Q and A function in the Whova app. There's a place in there, and then um, Carmen or Elizabeth put Carmen's um, website, which we appreciate. Um, and so starting at ten fifty five. Right here in this room, we have the wonderful Anjali Lafari sharing her expertise on hypnosis to support your postpartum journey. And room two is hosting And So Fatherhood Begins, which will be a panel of real dads taking your questions. And um, the chest feeding and breastfeeding talking circle will be in room three. So thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Carmen. That was lovely and made us all very hungry. Um, <laughs> everybody enjoy your next session. Thank you so much. Thank you.